So thank you. So, uh, so, so it's great to be here, and it's a, a lovely room uh, to be, and a lovely place to be in Dublin. And I'm um, loving the cabaret-style tables. Isn't that nice? Sort of for, uh, I believe that's the term, cabaret. So, uh, so you can look at each other and interact. So, and that's certainly my uh, goal: is to in, encourage people to talk together and meet together, uh, and to support one another and hopefully take things forward in other forums as well. So um, what I'm uh, talking about uh, today, as I'm a member of FASTA and, and the Environmental Network, uh, what I'm talking about, uh, my title is Building Personal Community and National Resilience Face of Climate and Biodiver Biodiversity Breakdown, uh, or as I like to uh, subtitle it, is uh, how to possibly respond in the, to the mess we're in without going insane. So, uh, I'm going to talk about the challenges we're, we're in and the very difficult uh, predicament we're in, and then what can be constructive action in that? What can we do in response to that? And I'm sure you're all thinking, uh, thinking about that. Uh, so it's pretty, um, uh, I'm particularly interested in the psychological factors and the philosophical factors that, that's involved in this, because it's a little bit really deep in our human psyche as to what's happening. It's not really an information loss that's out there. It's not really, it's a whole sort of how we are dealing with this emotionally and, and psychologically and philosophically that, that's at issue. So I want to give that a little bit of a space uh, to come up. Uh, but it, it could be a challenging space to come up because people um, don't like talking about reality or difficult issues. Uh, and sometimes there's a discomfort in that. So just acknowledge that. But uh, there's also a great liberation in doing that and hope and resilience comes from the end of that. So. Before I start, I'm going to, uh, I have a colleague here, Oana Marion, who we work together, and we're very good friends as well. Um, and uh, we're, we're doing a series of different workshops uh, uh, in this area over time. And Oana's going to start with a little introductory uh, exercise, just to, get to, to help us. Yeah, so a little icebreaker uh, for the emotional work that we're going to be doing today. So I, thanks John, um, I'm Oana. And my area of work and study is around grief, uh, poetry, uh, the aftermath of religion. So kind of a lot of the emotional, psychological spaces that we are talking about. So what I, the first thing I wanted to acknowledge 
acknowledge is uh, gratitude for being in this room together. There are many things you could have chosen to do today, this afternoon, this very chilly but beautiful day, but you decided to be here, and so um, it's not uh, in the interest of being corny to say there's a real purpose for acknowledging gratitude, and if you'll notice, if you've ever seen presentations given by indigenous groups, or even if you think about rituals such as saying grace at dinner, uh, there's a real reason, there's a purpose to acknowledging um, what we have, acknowledging the things that we're grateful for. And in this case, that purpose is to resource us for being able to uh, acknowledge, approach, think differently about some of the more challenging feelings that come up around uh, climate change. So think of, we think of gratitude and joy as a kind of like a buffer, <laughs> a little baseline, a place where we can uh, start with more openness. So we all come in, we have maybe different ideas of what um, we're going to encounter, the information. A lot of us probably already know many of the things. It's not a problem, as, as John said, it's not a problem about knowing, but it's sort of knowing how to process the things we know. How do we know the things we know and how do we do something with the things that we know. So just as a kind of introductory invitation, to bring a little bit of um, a little bit of joy and a little bit of lightness and gratitude in the room, and just to make people just a little bit uncomfortable speaking next to, to people next to them, <laughs> maybe choose somebody that is nearby, and if there is, if you have a choice between someone you know and speak to, and someone you don't know, speak to the person you don't know. And I just want to pose a question for you, which is, what is something? It's an encounter you had recently in nature, whatever you consider nature, um, with an animal, a human animal or a non-human animal, uh, that has brought you joy or laughter recently. Uh, and we'll just really just take two minutes to share uh, back and forth, and um, and then we'll continue with the rest. Sure. Thank you very much. Off you go. Off you go. <laughs> well, we know each other. Great extra chairs coming in. I like that. So, that's, that works, doesn't it? So, we're going to finish. If I can bring you back from your, uh, if I can bring you back from your joyful conversations. <laughs> Great. So, I hope that was a nice start uh, to, to, to tap into your motivation and your care for the world that we're in, because uh, it needs a lot of caring. So uh, what I'm going to cover in the talk today, I'm going to, let's put all these up here. Um, I'm going to first overview the climate and biodiversity breakdown and the era of polycrisis we're in. Uh, I'm going to propose what it's all about, the central cause of all that, uh, which, is, which is overshoot, which is more of a predicament than a, than a, pro a, a, a problem. Um, uh, and then I'm going to help us understand our psychological response to, to, to what's going on and why we're responding the way we, we are, and then propose some ideas about action, what is a constructive action in these circumstances, and then move on to resilience and how you can build your own resilience in these, uh, in these challenges. So there are the five parts. I will take a pause now and then just to give you a chance to discuss some of the ideas and get some interaction and thoughts from you, if that's okay. Uh, but I'll just press on and, uh, through the, and then we'll, we'll take a couple of pauses. Does that sound okay? Great. So let's, uh, let's look at the first bit. So we're in an era of a perfect storm, I think, of sort of uh, climate breakdown, uh, biodiversity collapse. It's, a, it's a, poly, a perfect storm of existential challenges. Like, uh, historically, people were only, only talking about one or two. Do you remember people who've been environmental for a long time? Do you remember peak oil? Does anyone remember peak oil? That's still there, by the way. That's still going on. We're running out of resources, but it's not mentioned. And then there was climate change. And now we've all these other ones that are emerging. Uh, they're all interrelated, but it's worth surveying what's going on and, what, and, and why, what, what is happening and propose a cause on that. Uh, so some people use the term polycrisis, if you like it or not, but there are many, many crises happening all at the same time uh, that we're in the middle of. Uh, and, and let's just, just survey them before we start. So we obviously have climate breakdown. Everybody's aware, more aware of that now in, in these in times because there's all the fires, there's these huge heat waves. Uh, there was even an article in the Irish Times there about the GAA schedule being interrupted. So it must be getting through uh, uh, that because it's raining more. 
uh, and so forth. So, so there's this growing awareness of this serious climate break, and it's very scary. Even today, I was just reading, sometimes when I'm brave, I read the climate news in The Guardian. I have to be sort of have a good, strong cup of tea. Did anyone read the one about the Greenland ice melting? 20, is it 20 million tons an hour? I have to read that again. 20 million tons an hour, much faster than they thought, which will, could probably disrupt the entire uh, Atlantic drift next year. Uh, so, so get used to the cold, <laughs> because it could be you know, large disruptions to temperature. So there's all this very scary news that you, you're out there uh, about climate breakdown. I don't really have to labor on that, but it's a vast, a very big subject, an intercomplex uh, set of things that are happening, that have been happening over uh, many, many years, uh, uh, and so forth. Now, interesting enough, Ireland's been relatively uh, buffered from, from climate. Like, like, when I talk to, in FASTA, we're an international organization, right? we have colleagues in Canada and Australia, we do Zoom calls, and in, in America and in California, and they directly experienced, uh, one person nearly lost all their, their house in a, in a forest fire, they had to leave for several months, and they don't know if they can go back. Uh, and the, the, the colleagues in, 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 in uh, Canada, in, in, in this vast temperature differences. But in Ireland, we, we relatively buffered. We had a couple of floods. We had a cool summer that everyone was giving out about. But that was all, these are all uh, features of climate change. So we're relatively buffered, but it's still there and all coming down. Um, there's also the, the biodiversity collapse uh, that's all around. Uh, this is, it seems to be less visible to people, uh, unless you're sort of an ecologist, quite sensitive to nature. Um, but it's uh, this collapse of pollinators. For me, it's one that really, heart, I find it heartbreaking, uh, being quite interested in nature. And uh, uh, I have a small farm in Leitrim. And does anyone in Leitrim knows all the death of all the ash trees that have all yeah. died? Uh, and it's sort of devastating. They hope there was some resilience. There probably isn't. Is, you know, there's a real loss of them all. And then there's a disease of sycamores that's coming that will wipe out most of the sycamores. So there's this... Uh, very big collapsing biodiversity and plants and nature that's happening is a very big tragedy. And it's not only just a tragedy uh, uh, for, the, for the wildlife themselves, it's a tragedy for us because it's very simple. We are biodiversity and we completely interdepend on it. If there's no bees, there's no humans. Uh, no insects, no humans. Uh, there, there, it's a whole web of life. So, so that's a major, major crisis that's happening. And as I say, it's quite heartbreaking because when I'm in Leitrim and I stare, you know, you stare at it all the fields, there's a quite a different view of it. When a farmer, some of the traditional farmers stare at the, the green fields, which are deserts of ryegrass, in my view, <laughs> no, not, a, not an insect in sight. Uh, they, they see this as an improved land, fertilizer land, as opposed to these sort of rugged, barren, uh, sort of brown, falled over biodiverse swards uh, full of nature. So, so uh, that's a tragic, but also heartbreaking, but also very existential. These are sort of, you call these existential crises. Existential means that they're actually potential to, to really result in extinction and, the, and uh, really the end of the human race in, 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 uh, if, they, if they are unchecked and continue in this way. So, so we have that. Um, and then we've ones that are, are still there, resource depletion, where we're consuming the world's resources at vast quantities like oil, uh, even the fossil resources, but all the natural resources, but all the fossil resources, and they're all peaking and declining. Uh, even though you might think that's not happening, that is, is happening to show shortages of all these th things are, are there. That was what people used to really worry about, uh, but it, uh, it's still continuing to build. Uh, then there's the build-up. This is a, the new one. I remember I wrote to my, um, this is about... Uh, eight years ago, I've, uh, John Gibbons is a very close friend of mine. He's a very a brave environmental journalist, and uh, uh, he's been writing on this subject very bravely. I'm more of a coward, uh, hiding behind uh, hiding behind his work in some ways. But uh, I remember telling you when we when I read up about the microplastics catastrophe just about 10 years ago, and I wrote to John, I go, have you read this? And he says, now you've given me another reason not to sleep at night, he said, <laughs> he wrote back to me. Uh, so there's this huge toxic environment we're living in as well. There's, a, there's uh, microplastics in the placenta, uh, in, uh, in the bloodstream. Uh, there's the forever chemicals that are accumulating in the environment uh, that are actually just keep accumulating, never break down, that are uh, linked to cancer and infertility and so, and, and so forth. So, so vast quantities of this huge toxic environment all those toxic chemicals don't go away, you know. They just accumulate in the, in the, in the environment. Uh, and then we have pandemics and diseases you put the, uh, that are increasing in frequency, a lot to do with our biodiversity breakdown and diseases of plants, but diseases of humans are, uh, uh, that are, are, will, will, will continue to grow. 
And then we have the, not to mention the old nuclear bombs and meltdown that, that are potentially there. There's was it, about 400 reactors in the world that all require a, a grid to keep them alive. Uh, that if, they, if the grid was removed, they'd all go into meltdown. That's not when you've got Putin armed with nuclear weapons uh, to even to consider that. So there's all these existential crises that are there. Uh, so um, how are you feeling? <laughs> Just a, do, are you, do, do you remember that little joyful encounter you had that Awana mentioned? <laughs> Has that sustained you through this? <laughs> now, I'm using a very interesting... You, you've been wiped out. Uh, I, uh, I'm using an interesting thing called humour. Humour is, is a very, very sophisticated human coping response to difficult circumstances. Uh, but you can also get it wrong. Sometimes you can go too far. So I apologise in advance for any offence that I cause. Uh, 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 with, with jokes. So, but actually, that's a way of dealing with these, these challenges. So these are, as I talk about this, I want you to know what you're feeling, because this is very hard to talk about. So people will do anything to avoid it uh, and deny it, and you won't be even allowed to talk about it. Um, as I discovered, I've been worrying about these things for 20 years, a long time, isn't it? And, and, and I've discovered it's a real room emptier. Uh, uh, <laughs> so if people wanted to empty a pub at night, you know, one of those pubs in the west of Clare that they can't get the people out because they're all singing and having a good time, I would come in and talk to them about climate change. <laughs> and they'd all go home uh, and give up music forever. So, uh, uh, so, so uh, it's a very difficult subject, that, uh, to, 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 to make sense, a uh, room enter. But um, I'm a realist. Facing reality is a liberating thing. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, how, how really truly tuning into reality and facing the real world is, it liberates you, lets you live well. Uh, 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 in a way that you, you won't ever have dreamed, <laughs> have dreamed of uh, uh, in that way. So um, uh, let's look about also uh, uh, some other challenges that are worth saying. These are what I call our system challenges. We have the existential challenges. Now, system challenges, this is the way we've created the world that makes things worse or creates the problem in the first place. So we have uh, the extractive economic model. Uh, that we're now not allowed to critique. I just had a chat with John. He probably won't let me, I probably can't say this, John, it's top secret. He said, you can't mention in the Green Party because the coalition partners e economic degrowth, or you can't mention in Europe, or, or you can't say that. You can't say the economic model's bad. It's like a heresy. Uh, but it's, it's overtly bad and rapier and destructive of the environment. It's a one-way model of uh, you plunge the environment on renewable things, you consume them, and you create waste. That's what it does. There's no circularity to it. So it's an extractive plundering model that's not sustainable. Uh, and it always has been. But it, just, it stops when it runs out of resources. Uh, it's also deeply inequitable. It just makes people rich. Some people rich. Now, it does give great things, great, like... Uh, projectors, uh, uh, we wouldn't be able to do this stuff, uh, cars, you know, all these things. It does create all these great things, and things, including things that we really do value, like modern medicine. We all love uh, the idea of uh, getting an operation, a very sophisticated operation of our own well, or very, very complex pharmaceuticals. They're all created by a rapier, destructive economic model that pl plunge, pushes out a few good drugs, and uh, one, uh, one, uh, single-use plastics, and the materials in the modern medical industry. We all think that's great stuff, isn't it? But equally, it, it, the cost of that is enormous as well uh, to, in the environment. So it's, not, it's a complexity, not all good, all bad. If you get into, into thinking things all good, all bad, you're, you've missed the philosophical part of this. Uh, it's more of a, the way we are, that we, uh, and the way we are is nature, or nature uh, as much as anything else. But the extractive economic model is very problematic. And uh, aside from it being a consumptive model that can't be sustained, uh, it also is deeply inequitable. It just creates, it, it benefits very few people at the top. You know, all the elites. Like we, we know we have all the billionaires. There's going to be a trillionaire soon. Is that, I'm so pleased about that, aren't you? Is that great <laughs> that one of them is going to be? <laughs> That's such a ach human achievement. Uh, but equally, and, and when equally, we're all in Ireland, we're all beneficiaries of this model. We are so wealthy in comparison to the billions of people who live on a few dollars a day. We consume all their resources. So you're not, you don't escape this responsibility. Uh, uh, you know, as you're planning your flight to the Maldives, oh, sure, we, it's a lifetime trip, or whatever justification you use for that, or for whatever, you're consuming all those resources at a vastly greater rate than the other people in the world. So it's inequitable. So, uh, 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 we're not try trying to blame anyone. Now ah, we are, sure. We, who, do we, who do we blame? Because everyone wants someone to blame <laughs> in this way. So, uh, but equally with the model, it's an unstable e economic model as well. It, it, it requires 
um, uh, it's a debt-based model from a like, faster study these things in great detail. So it, it just accumulates vast quantities of, de of debt um, and it requires growth to be stable. So the, if the economy doesn't grow by about 1% a, a year on average over a long period of time, it'll collapse. So it'll crash. And that's just inherently mathematical because you have to repay back the debts. So, so it has to keep growing, it has to keep consuming, it has to consume more. Um, to give just an example of that, when, when the economic model started in Britain, let's bring the British, any British people in? Because they are all very proud, of the, very proud of the Industrial Revolution, started in, uh, in Iron Bridge, I visited there, and uh, they, uh, when, one of the big features of the Industrial Revolution in Britain was they created all these, they put out all these poor uh, people who used to make things in their homes, you know, uh, clothes in their homes, these cottage industries, remember they used to make uh, fabrics, and then they put them into, into factories, to make it more industrial scale for other people to make much more money than them. That were the, the, the middle class or the industrial owners. And then as that was all happening, it was great. They're all happy. They're making loads of money. And then they ran out of markets because they're making more stuff and nobody, they couldn't force anyone else to buy it in, in England because everyone had too much of this junk anyway. So, so they went, they, they, they decided we'll go to India and we'll put out all the Indian clothes makers out of business as well because they, they went and sold all their stuff there. That, so that's how they... That's how they keep the that expand, is it? It needs to expand, it needs to grow to be stable. Not to, not to stay the same, it needs to grow to be stable. It's a very problematic model. Okay, so, um, and of course then it leads to soaring inequality and injustice, which we, we've, uh, the system challenges, we, we have these intolerable differences of wealth uh, in, in, our, in our societies. Uh, uh, we've wars and political polarization. We didn't need any other things. We, we've this sort of lack of agreement about basic common truths. Uh, uh, and so forth, which is all made much worse by misinformation, social media, and AI, uh, uh, the technology uh, that we were all uh, growing uh, uh, in, in our enormous uh, uh, ways. Um, what is interesting to me is the whole, um, now I'm a technologist, uh, I studied uh, physics and technology, and so I have a sort of very sort of uh, love-hate relationship with technology. In a way, I love all it does, but then I uh, I realize the problems with it as well, and I'm cr critical of it. Uh, technology never tells you what it's bad at. So, uh, uh, when, you, when they come out to say social media is going to be great, they never tell you what's going to be all the consequences of, of that. And if you look at what social media has done, there was another study there in The Guardian uh, as well, just came out today. I, I, I read this study to, to debrief from the ice melting in the, in the, in the greenhouse. Uh, they, they, they showed that actually people's reading levels are plummeting because they're reading on screens and social media. Children, the attention is, is, gone to the, is gone to the dogs, so to speak. Uh, and there was a study about re that, uh, that books are much better to read than screens in terms of uh, knowledge acquisition. So, so all that social media and technology creates some good things, like we all now can look at cute cats very easily, uh, but it has a great cost. To, uh, uh, to, to our attention by, and one of the biggest challenges that is our intended consequence is people don't see the truth anymore. There's no, uh, we've misinformation, which is really problematic, uh, and it's actually destabilizing democracy. So that was, uh, 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 so there's no, because you need an agreement about certain truths before there's democracy. So we have all these system challenges that we're dealing with as well. So uh, how are you feeling so far? It's good, getting better? Is it, you cheering up yet? <laughs> okay. okay, great. Uh, so let, let's think about what we can do about uh, understanding the, the, these challenges. What, what's, what's at issue here? Um, so I like the concept. You only heard the concept of a wicked problem. Have you ever heard of a wicked problem? So because we always, uh, uh, is there anyone who's a an engineer here? Any engineers? Usually engineers here, because engineers are brought up to believe we have a problem and there's a solution, don't you? Uh, uh, and it's very frustrating when there is no solution. So wicked problems are ones where th there is not. Uh, when you think of a problem and a solution, it doesn't really equate like that. Uh, so there's no single, easy, or certain solutions to, to what's going on. Um, uh, and solutions to one problem can create problems in one area. So this is really important to understand, because when people start getting involved in this area, they think there's always this maximum, we must do this, and this will solve the problem, that we must reduce our, 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 our emissions. That'll sort out climate change. Isn't that, the, isn't that the, the maximum? Not that these things are good or bad, but actually also, if you do reduce emissions and stop fossil fuels, if you stop that in society, that would have other consequences as well. Like it would, there would be less employment, you'd get a collapse in the economy, you'd get sort of uh, more widespread poverty, there'd be shortages uh, as well of all these goods we want. Uh, now, that, you might think that's fine, but people aren't saying that. So, 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 so a, 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 a solution 
in one area that can cause lots of problems in other areas, or the whole area of renewables. Oh, let's switch to renewables. That's what they all say, don't they? That's a great solution. Yeah, but if you switch to renewables, uh, if you switch to uh, create all those batteries, then you'll uh, have to destroy the, to get the same energy, you'd have to destroy vast quantities of the biosphere to, and consume it, create more pollution, uh, and you'll actually create more problems uh, than, than when you did, uh, than you had when you were, where you were just using a more simpler fossil fuel uh, engine and so forth. So, so these solutions are very problematic, uh, uh, especially because they're, they're often dishonestly presented. Like, for example, um, you know, they say electric cars are designed to save the planet. They're really designed to save the car industry uh, be, uh, because, <laughs> because they, they need something to, to have a greenwashing agenda. Because what really would be, because even a, a, a good solution, um, that might really help involves great sacrifice and political difficulty. So what would help the environment is not green, is not electric cars, it's no cars. <laughs> are, 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 fi are reducing car consumption, less use, exactly, shared use, uh, and also people giving up cars and, and not agreeing not to have them. But would you get people to agree to that? Could you get people to agree to that? Could you politically say that, say, we should all stop driving or we should all stop flying, let's agree to that? So these are really, but that's actually what is, what is, what is, what is wicked set of problems we are. That's the, these sets of choices that are need that. Now, the other thing is also uh, when people look at uh, personal solutions to these, and, and personal solutions are very good because like, you know, somebody will say, I'm not going to fly, and that's a really important decision to make and a very admirable decision to make, or say somebody says, I'm not going to drive, uh, I'm not going to consume those resources. And I think they're great things because they're actually inspirational and they inspire people and they actually bring things to an agenda. But do they work? Uh, do they solve the problem? They don't, uh, unless you have a system change. Because what happens, let's say, just take the average individual who says, um, I'm not going to uh, fly, okay? What do they, they save then maybe 100 euros on that flight. What do they do with that 100 euros? What do you do? You buy other stuff, don't you, Joan? What do you buy, Joan? <laughs> go on, tell us. Go on, you can admit it. What do you buy? I, she's not going to tell me, no. It's too embarrassing. <laughs> and that's the thing, because as an environment, you feel embarrassed, don't you? But it, so you might buy something. You might say, I'll buy some clothes, which are made by a child in Bangladesh uh, and shipped across the uh, huge explosive labor and cotton industry that use pesticides. So if you buy anything else in the environment with the money, you cause about the same destruction. Is it? I should buy second-hand clothes. Oh, you could buy second-hand. Well done. So that's better. Second-hand books are probably a better. Second-hand is better, correct. <laughs> but, 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 no, but let, let you know, these, these, are, these gentlemen, brilliant, brilliant thoughts. Uh, but what if you then, you bought the second-hand clothes, right, and, and, and you gave the money, what's that other person going to do with the money? So, so, uh, so unless you take the money out of the environment, out of the circulation, it still gets consumed somewhere. Let, let me think, uh, these are just difficult things. I'm not saying you shouldn't do all of those things are inspirational because you're preparing for a system change. Uh, but unless you limit these things globally or collectively, you can't make the change. Like for example, let's say somebody say, I put the money in a bank. Some people say that to me. I put it and I save it for something. Uh, what does the bank do with the money, the 100 euros that you save on the flight? It lends it out to an oil guy, yeah. And it, it doesn't lend 100 to him, it lends it 1,000. It is a tenfold lending. So you've increased the consumption of the environment by tenfold by putting it in a bank. A nice by a nice painting. <laughs> well, what do people think of buying an art, a, a, a piece of art? Well, they, he might, the artist do the, artist do the money? And yes, <laughs> he's probably a billionaire. Oh, no, he probably isn't. He's not an artist. Now, there are good ethical consumption. Like, for example, you could. Um, like this is a, you can have this as a little puzzle, a little dinner table pu uh, puzzle. What could you buy that it, it enhances the environment? And there's some good suggestions. Any others? Trees. Buy trees, yeah. You could buy a bog. You could buy a bog and protect it and take the money out of that. The money goes out of circulation then. Once you don't think you want to get that money back. Is that, that's not bad. Buy a bog is my, fi is my final, <laughs> final offer. Uh, and protect it. Use your money to protect the natural environment. That's a pretty... Fail safe solution, I think. Beg your pardon? Become poor. Can't, become, become poor, yes. You can become poor, yeah. But if you say you make, save the money, what do you do with your money uh, when you're becoming poor? Like if you have some choice, maybe you know money and uh, poverty is not is a choice. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not your choice, uh, or maybe it is a choice you're going to do that. But, so anyway, I'm just saying these are complex solutions. Do, 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 do you hear what I'm saying? These are wicked problems. It's not 
simplistic answers to what we're dealing with. Uh, so, um, so I want to give you just a proposal for a central understanding of where we're at, and then we'll, we'll take some, uh, uh, we'll, uh, go into psychology as we take some discussion. So I think the best conception of what's going on is, is overshoot. People have heard of overshoot? Because uh, there's a very simple uh, concept, uh, and the first person I, I don't understand is William Catton. Do you know his, his work, the book Overshoot? Uh, and it sort of seems to explain, um, and he, he takes a very long historical view. He looks at other civilizations, and he says, C human civilization, and all of them do it, they reach a point where they overconsume the natural world uh, beyond its limits. So they stop, like, uh, eating, you know, this, they, 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 instead of eating the seeds of the plant, they eat the whole plant, if you like. Or they don't save, uh, and and they then it, be, it becomes beyond the car, the car, uh, carrying capacity of the planet, and then obviously it's sustainable, unsustainable, and then inevitably leads to collapse. So he thinks that's just the the way economies work, or the way human civilization work. Uh, if you give it a, a more, um, uh, and he looks at long, other civilizations, we look at the Roman civilization, uh, uh, or some of the smaller ones, and all the Mayan. They, it's all of a similar pattern. The, the Romans. Overconsumed. What environment do they overconsume? Do you know? Yeah, well, Italy, Italy. They used to grow all their grains in Italy, and then they depleted all the soils from overconsumption. So they had to get them from North Africa. Then that's why Mark Antony had to go to Cleopatra because she had all these fertile. Egypt was fertile crescents, or fertile plains of, uh, and they had, uh, they had loads of animals and so forth. So he got Cleopatra's grain then in boats, uh, and then that was all gone, uh, uh, and then they collapsed. Uh, uh, you could, or, or they also had a fossil fuel. It's not really a fossil. They had an energy system in the Roman Empire, which eventually gave up the gold. What was the Roman Empire energy system? Olive oil. Olive oil. <laughs> Brilliant answer, but not true. I wish it was. <laughs> I, I wish it was. I wish it was olive oil. I wish it was olive oil. No. Uh, who built the Colosseum? Do you know the Colosseum? Slaves. slaves. So they had, they had a, this free energy called, well, it's terrible energy called slaves. So the Colosseum was built by. Uh, 500 or thousands of uh, Eastern European slaves. So they bring them over and they work them to death. Um, and, they, and that's how Rome was built uh, on, on that. So that was their energy source. So unsustainable, you have to keep getting more slaves is, is the issue uh, and you run out or you can't get enough to feed the central. Uh, so, uh, uh, so overshoot is our issue. Is that? We're over consuming the environment. Is that? Over consuming the environment and we're way over consuming it. We're way into this. Uh, so we propose that if we look at our civilization, uh, you know, a big growth on fossil fuels and consumption, we've reached the top of it, and now we're in decline. I first showed this graph, I'm very bad on graphics, uh, ten, 12 years ago at the conference, and I said we are here at the peak, but we're actually now over the edge, George. We're now in decline at the moment, the last 10 years. We're now in descent, is that okay? Uh, which will just continue to descend as all these limits interplay, is that? So that's, what, that's what's happening, okay? Okay, uh, uh, and and these, these are all natural limits that we're we're, we're encountering now. Uh, 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 so uh, another way to explain this is um, I, like we're caught in a double bind. Do you know the concept of a double bind? It's a double bind. You get an impossible instruction to carry out. Uh, so and it, it goes back to our economy, like the extractive economic model, which has brought some benefits, as I mentioned, like. Uh, uh, lots of things that you enjoy and everything we enjoy in our world, in our world. Uh, but it requires continuing economic growth in order to avoid collapse. But however, economic growth depletes the environment resource base on which the economy depends. So it grows, but it kills the thing it's growing. Uh, it grows upon. Is that, uh, uh, or even more simpler is the you know the Aesop fable, the goose who laid the golden egg. So, so our environment was like a, go uh, a goose laying golden eggs. All these incredible things like fruits and plants and things we could eat, so you, you get, but only just one egg a day, <laughs> the goose in the Aesop fable, but the farmer gets greedy, so he kills the goose to see if there's any more eggs in there, and of course there wasn't, so, okay. Uh, so that, that's a sort of simple, uh, uh, simple uh, 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 view uh, of, of understanding. Does that make sense? So, okay, so let's take a little pause. How does all that sound? You're going to look now next at... Um, uh, understanding a response, because uh, you need to sort of dose reality before we can think about what we do about it, okay? Because nobody will tell you this in, uh, out, out there. You're not allowed to even say anything critical of the economic model. Uh, and these are sort of, you could test these, these are sort of limiting, it's like limits uh, of simple limits. I, I'm a sort of simple thinking physicist. Uh, they're just obvious rules and parameters and boundaries of energy systems or whatever you want, uh, want to think. And, and physics laws just don't bother, they don't mind what people think about them. 
They just keep going, you know, and so forth. So, so now it's quite also quite a devastating reality in many ways. Would that, would that make sense? Or do you feel, or how do you feel about it? That, yeah? It's devastating, yeah. So, and the important thing is um, to acknowledge that because what happens is people then want to avoid that feeling. So they want to avoid that and then they'll, you'll do anything but to, uh, to avoid it. But actually that doesn't help cope. Uh, with the reality in. So, uh, so well, let's look a little bit at our response. Uh, why is no one listening? Because people have been banging on about this. I've been emptying rooms in Clare for, th for 20 years now, uh, uh, and uh, nobody is li <laughs> nobody's listening um, in this way. Uh, and why is that? And it's, you know, there's a load of psychological factors to that. Uh, is the, the th of denial. People want to avoid discomfort uh, or uncomfortable truths. Uh, and a nice little, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on not understanding it. So, uh, so you really will cling to a, a non-truth rather than say, uh, you know, I can take, you know, I want to take away your lifestyle that you become someone that you can't fly anymore, you can't do this, or you can't die, you have to share all your resources. People say, oh, oh, it must be not true, you're a crazy person. That's better than that. Uh, uh, and there will be plenty of politicians and people willing to give on truths because they will be elected in this way. So, so it's because it's very difficult and dis a comforting uh, reality uh, to face. Uh, as, uh, so let's just make sure I'm in the, uh, covered everything I want to say. Okay, um, on that, yeah, okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so let's look then at a bit more of that. So what can we do uh, and why are we avoiding this? So it's because we avoid these difficult emotions. So I'm gonna go through these difficult emotions because as a, as a working in psychology in the area of, of mental health, uh, the most important thing I'm often doing is helping people face pain, okay? Uh, there's, there's a wonderful quote uh, from, and accept pain and difficult things. Uh, and there's a real liberation to that uh, when they do that. Uh, there's a great quote from a psychologist, Ro Ronnie Lang. Does anyone know R.D. Lang? Has anyone read some of his uh, stuff? Very good. He was on the Late Late Show once. Do people know that? Long, long time ago with Gay Byrne. And he was drunk on it. This is all true. Uh, and uh, they had a big rude encounter. And uh, Gay Byrne said he was a very rude man. Look it up. It's in the archives. <laughs> so he's going to. So he knows about pain. Ronnie Lang does, uh, I think. But he has a great quote. Is that the only pain you can avoid in life is the pain caused by trying to avoid pain. Okay. We got it? That's a nice little let's thank you. The only pain you can avoid in life is the pain caused by trying to avoid pain. So we're in this reality, so trying to avoid it and not experience the pain that it causes us will just make it worse. You'll just create more pain for everyone else. That, have you got it? So, so we need this sort of bravery to understand our emotions. So there's obviously anxiety and fear. And I'll just put these all up here. Uh, when you start facing this reality, it, people are worried. A uh, guy was scared reading that art news about Greenland this morning again. Um, uh, I find then I should have to talk to somebody about it. So sorry, sorry that you're the first candidates. <laughs> uh, um, but then you could also feel anger and rage about what's going on, and rage against. And uh, uh, then you feel sorrow, depression, and despair, and guilt about that, that you're causing this, and blame. It's very easy to blame others. There's a whole this dynamic, because in the, in, in the environmental movement, the environmental movement is as much as part of all these feelings as well, because they participate as much in denial as the next man. Because the, the, the denial might be that it, there's easy solutions. If only we got this in, we'd all be fine. Or if only this happened, we'd all be fine. Uh, um, but that's a sort of denial as well. Are they rage against, it's easy to take out target, easy, give out to easy targets, but actually there's a whole complexity of what's going on as well. Uh, so, so it's about being acknowledging all these feelings in yourself. Um, but there's also good feelings as well that emerges once you face reality. Uh, you can experience courage and determination. In fact, the most important um, uh, virtue uh, in, in dealing with this is courage. It's courage to face it, courage to take action, courage and determination to make a difference. Is that, okay? That's the most important uh, uh, f uh, virtue. Uh, the, and then gratitude, appreciation, because that motivates you to love the world, love people, and to care for what's happening. So these are all, you can also be evoked these positive uh, feelings as well. You often have to process through, uh, process through these difficult ones as well. Let me uh, look at how you're processing emotions and then we'll take a, a, a break. So um, how do you process your emotions? So with anxiety, when you feel anxious, 
Uh, it's about reaching out it makes a difference and talking to somebody that you're anxious. Don't, don't, you're not alone. That's the most important thing. And to do, take some action, uh, some step, small step of action that you're going to do. It could be that if you're suddenly worried about um, pollinators, then you decide to uh, protect pollinators in your garden. You take some action. Or you join uh, your local uh, GIY group. Or you campaign for wildlife. Or if you're worried about climate, you become active in, in a party that takes it seriously. So uh, taking action is, 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 and reaching out is the important thing. Anger is a very difficult emotion. We could spend hours talking about this because anger is a very problematic emotion because people usually, anger is, not, is very irrational and, and often people um, pick the wrong target. Do you know the way they talk about, you know, somebody is upset and they kick the dog? They, they tend to take anger out on a more vulnerable person than themselves and not the powerful person who, who deserves it. Uh, uh, so targeting your anger, but anger is a very motivating emotion though, but you have to pick the right thing. It's very, um, there's a great quote by Aristotle, I don't have it, uh, the Greek philosopher, he says, to be angry is easy, but to be angry at the right person, at the right time, in the right measure, for the right reason, that's a challenge. <laughs> Okay, so, so that, that finding out, uh, channeling and knowing how to use your anger is a, is a life skill uh, 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 in this way. Uh, and depression, uh, when you feel all this, uh, and this is one that I've had to learn the most. Um, uh, also, it's one uh, Oana and I have many conversations about because uh, I get to fall into despair is a very common thing I, I, I find. And then I get sort of cynical uh, and uh, you know, I can get sort of paranoid. Uh, and, uh, but actually, the biggest moving processing, uh, uh, process for me is uh, grief, is expressing grief and sadness, that this is very sad and very hard, uh, uh, and letting people grieve. Uh, I the previous I do some work with people dealing, environmentalists and other people who are very worried about these, um, uh, 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 what's going on in the state of the world. And a lot of my is just holding space to let them grieve and be sad about it. Uh, uh, and the great thing about grief and sad, I don't know if anyone's grieved, most people have touched by grief at some point in their life or will be, or, or it's an inherent part of life because we, if, we, if, we if we live a long life, you know what people, it's great to live a long life, but if you live a long life, everyone around you dies. Isn't that right? So that's even worse. Go out early <laughs> in glory, like, uh, like Achilles or one of those guys. Uh, uh, so... Uh, so everyone experiences gr grief, but one, the great thing about grief is it's not static, it moves you, do you know what I mean? And, and once people grieve, they also experience gratitude, love, and appreciation. It's, a, it's quite a, an amazing emotion. So grief is very important. Uh, and then guilt and blame is to take responsibility if you feel guilty for what you've done. Uh, <laughs> take responsibility. It's a very, very, uh, it's a very uncanny virtue in the, in the modern world, isn't it? People don't do. Uh, uh, and then forgiveness, learn to forgive. Uh, yourself and others that you might uh, you might have to forgive some of those oil executives uh, 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 they're, they're, uh, or maybe not maybe you're still angry at them uh, <laughs> forgiveness is a sort of complex one a complex one about uh, emerges okay uh, and then activate your positive emotion uh, I'll put these up because this is what this is my big message to you you know is let's deal with this stuff so we can get to here and we can change the world okay uh, this is uh, the world, but not, not deluded. Uh, we're not deluded. We know what we're doing. We know, know reality. Um, uh, so we want to, uh, being courageous and determined, uh, grateful uh, for we've come so far, and to, and to activate love in action about what we're trying to do as, as, as people and individuals and society. Um, uh, some of the great models about uh, these are just one to think about. Do you know the film? Because I, I love... Um, uh, the uh, some, uh, you know the film uh, Scrooge, you know there, Char or Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. I like that uh, movie. Uh, it's not a movie; it's a book, obviously. And then, because um, there's this, uh, uh, he's obviously a mean-spirited man, isn't he? Cynical and money-grabbing, uh, which is, you know, that that's all of us. <laughs> or you know, the people all fly, you know, the Dublin airport's booming, um, and. Uh, uh, he uh, has this encounter with death and the law, you know, with all the three ghosts, you know, which challenges his core. And then he changes and becomes more gra grateful and, and wants to do things. But, but the best part of the thing, when he wakes up and he thinks he's dead, but he isn't, and he realizes he's still alive, and he talks to a boy in the street, I'm, what day is it? It's Christmas Day. He says, I'm still alive. He says, I've still time. 
okay? Uh, and he then can do some great works, okay? So you're still alive and there's still time. <laughs> so if you take it from Scrooge and Charles Dickens. Okay, so, uh, so let's take a pause, um, uh, give a little breakout, uh, um, and uh, we'll then get a little bit of feedback. So just in your tables, maybe uh, divide into your tables there, just maybe into two, have a little discussion in maybe in trees, I think is about right, so, uh, how a table naturally divide up. And uh, have a little share about what I've covered so far, and to talk about how you're feeling about the state of the world, what, and what does it evoke in you, negative and positive feelings. Is that okay? And then we're going to move on to action and resilience. Is that all right? Okay? So you have about five or so, so minutes or ten minutes to have a little discussion, and I'll get a bit of feedback. Okay. So we're going to finish up then. So, yeah, we just come back in here. Just get a couple of questions. Yeah. So, uh, so we just take a couple of comments uh, just to into the room. Would that be okay? So, just if anyone would like to be interested to hear your thoughts so far. Uh, before we look at um, the next bit is on uh, resilience building, constructive action. So any thoughts so far, or do you want to share? Yes, Sophia, did you put your hand up? Yeah. Yes, I, did. yeah. I was just thinking that, um, in my mind anyway, I'm preparing for, or I feel I'm preparing for collapse. Okay. And I'm trying to see if we can, the, the main emotion that I feel is grief. Grief. And mm -hmm. what I feel is, a need, a huge need for spaces to grieve together. Right. Uh -huh. So that's that's. So your yeah is to find spaces to grieve uh, and to get support. Exactly. Uh, when you're on your own, it's very hard. It's very hard. Yeah, and and uh, that's a great a, a, a great thing when you're grieving. Sometimes in society, um, when somebody's in grief, we steer away from them, and when somebody's grieving, they go away. And, and that makes it worse. So there's two parts to that. If you're in grief, reach out. You, uh, uh, and if you see somebody in grief, reach out. You know the way you know, somebody's after the funeral, you think, oh, they want a bit of space. They don't necessarily. You know, if, part people avoid because it's, it's a difficult emotion, isn't it? Uh, you know, if you say, I'm really grieving, I'm worried about the end of this, and I've lost so much, people think, oh, uh, that's hard for people to hear and hold a space for. So we, we will try to, one of the things we'll try to create, that's one of the things taking forward. Um, there is a feedback form there, so if you can put different things that you're interested in going forward, uh, make sure to fill it. Uh, that's something that Anna and myself are working on is in grief, uh, uh, supporting that grief process. So thanks, Sophia. The, the gentleman there then? Yeah, it's not something we discussed here, but some things that you mentioned, and I'm trying to figure it out, and that is, as Roy Keane said, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. 
I always like qu qu quoting the philosopher Roy Keane. Yes. <laughs> so now we know that the population of the world is going to be 10 billion by 2050. And we know that the population of the world is going to be 8 billion by 2030. Uh -huh. And we know today the population of the world is operating at 50% of its capacity of what we could do. And if we do stay as we are <laughs> and do nothing, just keep on trudging along as we're going, by 2050, we have 10, people, 10 million people working at 7 billion people at 50% efficiency. And that's going to be disaster and grief. So, and, said, and so we have 1 billion people by 2050. So if we don't do pressure, and I'm, I'm sure the actual generation that's here today are not thinking we're not up to the model here, we're not up to the standard. They're going to take on this and they're going to make sure that we like is going to be 10 billion people by 2050 at maximum efficiency of 90%. So and show you all up, this generation up. Okay, good. So you're hopeful that the generation taking it up, which is good. So do you want to go into Anna? I, I understand that people, I suppose I'm a, I'm a long time accepting what where, you know, climate change and, and, and biodiversity breakdown, but I, I, I have a sense that if you get too sort of fatalistic about it or a sense that there's a grief, I feel that there's a lot of, and I, I hate to be sort of like, you know, I am a sort of a positive cap, cap is half full rather than half empty. Mm -hmm. You know, I totally believe, you know, I read Richard Doubtwight when I was pretty young, and um, the growth illusion. So I understand all that. But I still think that there is like opportunities in a future that is actually going to be more connected, more equal, less guilt because everybody has got enough, mm -hmm. you know. So it's actually... You know, if you talk about what makes people happy, it's not things, it's not having that brand new car or the shiny things or this and that. It's about the connections they have with other people, yeah. that, the, you know, love, you know, yeah. community, you know, all those things are what actually make people happy. Absolutely. And that is a future that we can create. And that's a future you, know, you can uh, fight for. I think, and that we can fight for. Yeah. So, I, I mean, you, that's, yeah. if, if we, you know, I, I think of my mother's generation and I suppose, you know, through the seven, they have this idea that the nuclear bomb was going to kill everybody mm. and it certainly meant that people had this fast consumer you may as well just you know party till it go till it, till it drop or whatever or until it drops yeah. so I, I don't want us to get into that mindset yeah. you know that you can either grieve and be this person that's grieving or you can go listen hell we're we're we're, we're it's 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 well, not what we do it's it's there are no solutions so let's just you yeah. know so, so no, no, you're raising some great points there and i just uh put up this i think though your position is a very important one and you're a very admirable positive person who works so hard for the environment i know i know you personally and uh you do, do that and i think it's it's not either or you know it's not like um grieve do nothing uh it's actually uh, uh Grieve and then love and act. Uh, 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 but uh, that, that's the point. I mean, they coexist. Because if you don't know how to process these emotions, you will, you will end up paranoid, uh, cynical, uh, living the last thing. But if you process them, then you can live, fight for a, a, a great world. As, as a, that's the point I'm making. Now, now, some people don't experience these things as much. Do you, do you know what I mean? Maybe you don't. Do, do you just... Always optimistic and cheery. And, no, uh, no, I mean, I obviously feel sad. I've grieved, but I, I don't feel um, like I grieve when I see war and destruction yeah. and anger yeah. and, you know, violence, you know, and, 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 and you know, and, and things like that. But I, I try to sort of say, well, that's, you know, I don't want to keep grieving because, exactly. so you, want you know, to, there's... Exactly, you want to move on as well. Yeah, I want to move on. And, 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 I, and that's, what, that's what I'm about. I want to give people the tools to move on and to act and to do, live, live great lives and to fight for the changes you're, you're talking about. And actually to give the message that actually, even though we're in this descent, uh, even though we're in this collapse, it doesn't matter. The things that are, that are disappearing weren't that important. There's still hope, uh, uh, you know, there's still the community, there's still life, all oh, there's still the things that make people happy. But you need, people need to, need to know that they won't be flying to Ibiza in that world. You know, on a cheap Ryanair flight. Do you, do you know what I mean? And then they get a bit depressed about that. You mean I can't fly to Ibiza on a cheap flight? No. But you can sort of walk down the pier and sing, uh, okay, I think I'd rather go to Ibiza on the pier, you know, whatever. So, so you have to, 
you have to, uh, get, there's a reality check, because you know, a lot of the bar gets caught up in this uh, fa uh, fa uh, fantasy. There, there's a reality check about this. But there is a, a life to be, and, and that's a great point. I really appreciate you making it, Donna. Uh, we take it to this lady's point. Yeah. Sorry, I just, um, listening to that lady's speaker, it reminded me of uh, what happened whenever COVID uh, came down upon us, and there was massive uh, fear and uncertainty, yeah. and then, <coughs> <laughs> during the lockdowns, people uh, discovered, rediscovered nature. You know, all of a sudden people realised that within their, their two clicks, or oh, sorry, whatever. Two, two kilometres and then five kilometres. <laughs> and then they did a bit more. That there was all, and, and they had the time because everything slowed down and they went into the car and yeah. work, blah, 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 blah. And we had, at that point, even though there was a huge existential threat, we had a glimpse of what a degrowth could look like. Could look like. Yeah. I agree. We forgot. we forgot it. And we went crazy the other way that afternoon, didn't we? Then everything yeah. hopped on the line, everything flight over to wherever, wherever, wherever. So I think. They, they, they said, feck the horse down the road that I was feeding yeah, apples to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're off to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. But, but what, I, what that taught me was that if there can be systems change, there's enormous hope. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and then the second thing that occurred to me. Now, to, just to value, that's a very important point. But it's system change that's needed. That's the point. Yeah, the yeah, container yeah. wasn't there. Yeah, yeah. The system the, change. The, the mechanism is there. Yeah. Because it's deeply human. Yeah. Because yeah. we're socially connected and mm. that's who we are as humans, uh, as human animals, of course. Not people don't think we're animals, but we are. But we are, of course. But, but the other thing that occurred to me was that, and this came out of, um, mm. there was a big uh, march against uh, oil. Yes. And you were around the world, and the one of them was incredibly small, but you know, we did our best to show it there. And we ended up in uh, just a, a under dark and statue, right? And, it was this, and those people were talking, they're the usual activists were there. And then this young fellow came up, and he was mighty. And uh, he was very, I mean, they had done this protest, you know, they threw something on them, someone just, whatever, never mind. What he said was that it only takes. 3% of people to be committed to change for that change to happen. Yeah. Which isn't that bad. No. Because if we're all going around and feeling hopeless that people will be fully male, right? There's a chance, right? There's a chance that um, the rest of us who, who think differently can keep, you know, being hopeful and engaging in respectful, you know, debate conversation with people that change can happen. Yeah. So, I thought that was very helpful. Yeah, it is. And, and I, I have a complex relationship with hope, mm. by, by the way. <laughs> the thing with feathers. The, the thing with feathers I don't like, you know, the fluffy one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in active mode, it's, it's, a, it's a different one. But, but I, have a, I think a better thing is be determined to make a difference, to uh, be courageous, that we'll fight for the good world, and we won't abandon love, kindness. We, I mean, we'll fight yeah, for it. But, yeah. but you have to be determined in a vision of hope. That yeah. is worth doing, and it can be better. And things can if you don't have hope, right? you wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. Like there has to be, do you like you yeah. become determined because you have a goal, you have, yeah. you can see that yeah. there can be a difference, that it can be a future yeah. there. If you if if you don't have hope, then what what motivates you to to make that change? Well, you can be motivated by lots of things, like uh, like. Uh, you can be motivated by you want to make a difference. You can be motivated that you love people. You want to care. Because it's a complex. Uh, do you want to come in, Anna? Yeah, just on the on the topic of hope. I think there's a difference between hope that depends on a particular outcome. I'll only have hope if this thing happens, and hope that is, regardless, I may never see the change that I'm working towards, and the change I'm working towards were start, was started before I was born, but. My hope is in the action itself. So I think that kind of hope yeah. can take. That's that's what we would and call uh, active hope. Yeah. And just to link that, there's a you know the Czech um, nationalist and writer uh, Václav Havel. Um, he's a great quote on hope. I, it was the best. I did a I did an interray around Europe and I went to see his um, his uh, uh, it had a monument to him and he was a very inspirational person in how how we approach things. But he said hope is not the certainty that things will turn out well, 
but it's the commitment to make things turn out well no matter what way they turn out. Uh, so it's the commitment that you, it doesn't matter. You you'll, will act. Uh, so I, I, I go for his uh, which, uh, 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 version of hope. Uh, um, but it's uh, fantastic. Thanks. Uh, we'll just, let's move on to a couple of other things and we'll have another discussion in a few minutes because we just want to look at um, just a couple of ideas on constructive action and building resi resilience. Um, so like, because like, there is that pivot point and the reason why lots of people don't tell people the truth about the situation we're in is that we're worried that they'll give up hope. Uh, the, the government don't tell them in case everybody will go crazy and they'll start, you know, they take all the money out of the banks and the banks will collapse or they won't go, they won't turn up for work in the morning, they'll go crazy and they'll, they, we sort of infantilize the, the public, we don't tell them the truth. Uh, so we tell them a few lies, you know, if you do this, it'll all be fine, change a few light bulbs, it'll be grand, do, do, do you know what I mean? We don't, uh, but actually that's not, the evidence is not, it, it isn't the case for that, that people don't behave like that. Do, 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 do. Some people go crazy uh, when they know the truth, but they're going crazy anyway, do you know what I mean? Uh, like the other way, by not telling them the truth, they're, they're just going crazy, consuming, flying to Ibiza, go do whatever, let's blame Ibiza, uh, it's an easy target. Uh, like, like the, you know, since in the environmental movement, since when we knew what was happening since the 70s and more since the 90s, when, you know, the first summit, the first Earth Summit or what, in Rio, wasn't it in Rio, it was in 92? Um, uh, uh, but in, in the last, since 2000, we have emitted more emissions in, those t in the last 20 years than the entire uh, civilization before that. So telling them these falsehoods hasn't worked anyway, do, 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 do you know what I mean? So what worse can happen by telling the truth? You, uh, 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 so I think I take that. So there's a bit of uh, worry about uh, truth, but actually people can be inspired to, to know and be liberated uh, in, in, in the truth, the scientific truth of what, what, what's happening. So what can you do? And there's loads to be done. Um, uh, like for example, uh, uh, rather than which we're currently doing, we're looking at economic growth and systems about all this and all assumptions. Uh, uh, all our scholars are looking at, you know, sustainable growth and these sort of fantasies, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, like nonsense. It's Whole, what? It's an oxymoron. It's like economic, like it's, it's like a, it's like um, in, in Monty Python, the Ministry for S Silly Walks. Like it's, it doesn't make a, a great piece. So, but it would be better if they had an institute for the study of collapse. You know, do you know what I mean? Institute, we get all the great academics like Pat uh, uh, or whoever uh, to, 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 study these, uh, to study these areas. How, how can economic systems be slowed down best? How can we, without keep maintaining the really important things about the industrial world like medicine, say, uh, while reducing the frivolous things we don't need? Do you, do you know what I mean? Uh, like that, they're, that's really serious academic questions. Do, 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 do you know what I mean? That nobody's studying. Nobody's studying. How do we keep energy systems going in a contracting world? How do we keep food systems going in a contracting world? You'd want everybody studying that, wouldn't you? Why aren't they? Like, what the hell are you studying? <laughs> but, they're, uh, but they're not. Uh, are they studying a radical? They're, they're often, well, maybe they are. Sorry, they are. Risk to science. Who? Risk to science. Risk, risk. Yeah, risk. Yeah, there is the risk people. There's not enough of them. Let me just say, uh, yeah. So, so there is a lot to be studied what's going on and to think about how we're going to navigate. Everybody needs to do that. Um, and there needs to be a whole new set of systems that aren't even there yet. How do we manage society in this sort of collapsing, contracting world? How do we keep people motivated? How do we uh, uh, keep our energy and food systems going to basic needs of life? How do we promote people's well-being? How do we keep them entertained, all the good things? How do we keep culture going? Uh, you know, music, how do we keep music? Going? Probably one thing you definitely want to keep being made is musical instruments of some sort, you know, whatever. Uh, so, so there's a whole, there's tons to be done, but it has to be from the right paradigm. Do, do, uh, not, not uh, um, you know, they're talking about another runway in, in, um, in, in Dublin Airport. That's insane. Do, do, do. <laughs> but, if, you know, if you, uh, or whatever. Uh, uh, any initiative to conserve and protect nature is, is, is or I talked about, do, any millionaires in or billionaires? <laughs> so I tell you that I just well, yeah, the, the, I taught you where I knew you were skulking. <laughs> that, so so that you could preserve the existing natural world as much as we can would be. Uh, these are all very constructive actions, and then build your own resilience, uh, personal, household, community, and 
inter, uh, inter, uh, national, international. Um, and you need to mobilize everybody to this. So I, I, that, that, uh, everyone needs to act from this paradigm. Now, this is all coming. Change happens already. Like I said, just not talking about collapsing or contracting economies and food shortages and, um, doesn't stop them happening. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? In fact, that knock tape makes them come quicker. Do, uh, you know, when people say, oh, we can't possibly do that because that would be a contract, but it's going to happen anyway. So, uh, uh, so, so um, uh, a, a sort of prepared response is better. To quote the philosopher Roy Keane, uh, <laughs> uh, the great Irish philosopher, uh, 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 as, as we like to call him. Uh, so uh, let's look at a bit of resilience. So uh, we just have a discussion. Uh, I can't remember the gentleman's name, was you? Brian. Brian, uh, about what, how you define resilience. Uh, there's lots of definitions, but it's the ability to adapt and survive and try even in the face of adversity. So no matter what's happening, when things go bad, you still sur survive, adapt, and thrive. Uh, and that you can learn in difficult meaning, uh, in difficult events, and still have meaning and could do all the good things. So okay, that's what resilience uh, it, we're, we're after. Um, uh, 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 I, I like this, I find this very helpful to think of levels of resilience. So I'll, I'll put them all up here. Um, just, it's my little concentric circle. Uh, uh, graph. It's good, isn't it? It took me ages, ages to do that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so in the core is you, uh, thinking, you, how am I resilient to what's happening? Because uh, that's, your, that's your best, your locus of control is really your own actions is all you've got. That's the only thing you can definitely control. But uh, how do you want to be in these difficult times? How do you want to live? How do you want to uh, influence people, how do you want to, what do you want to bring to the world? And you can build your ability and resilience in that, to, that you can survive, that you can be a model to others, uh, uh, and so forth. And then your family, how can you build it around your family and household? Um, I've often these great, great discussions with uh, a, a person who's, who's aware about what's going on, who's trying to act in a certain way, but their partner is quite fond of the lifestyle. <laughs> Uh, one person we with, he was trying to make a commitment not to fly, and he's an environmentalist, uh, and his partner wasn't very happy with that idea. Do you, do you, uh, so how do you, how do you navigate in your, in your families about, uh, 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 about this? How do you create this, uh, that you can nurture and support each other this? And how do you build your community? Now, so, so levels is a nice way of, uh, of thinking about it. You start with yourself, but you, um, uh, there's a great, a great thing, I often do this when I'm doing personal development uh, with, with people, that you have your, uh, circle of c concern and your circle of influence. Do you, do you ever, have you heard that, those terms? So you might be, your concerns might be everything. You're concerned about internationally, national, community, family, and yourself. But what can you influence? What's your circle of influence? Like, you, you, can you influence the international scene? Probably not. National scene, even community, even your family. Can you influence your own children? Uh, 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 no is usually the answer. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but, but you can influence yourself. That's your, that is your primary act of influence, is, is to think about how you will act. Uh, so building your personal resilience is very important and your own ability to act. Uh, so uh, let's put up a couple of these then. So I'm a very big fan of Viktor Frankl. If you all know Viktor Frankl, the, um, I went to his uh, uh, house in, uh, when I was on my interrail in Vienna. And uh, uh, that was amazing, uh, you know, because he, he, he lived in a concentration camp, pretty challenging circumstances, you must agree. Uh, and then he wrote a book about resilience, I suppose you could call it, or thriving in difficult circumstances, and uh, man's search for meaning. And he's loads of very interesting uh, ideas on that. And, 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 and the people who survived and did well were the people who, there was different aspects he, did, he discovered. But one was, um, you can't, you, um, uh, the ability to choose your attitude to the circumstances was key. So, so he, he said that people who did well would often people have a goal uh, for the day. So uh, they, they would like say, I'm going to get through the day, I'm going to get one meal, I might get a second one if I go back in the queue, I'm going to work, I'm going to, I'm going to, and I'm going to share, they, they focus on simple things to get them through the day, I'm going to have a good, I have a good friendship there, I'll talk with that, I might even make a friendship with the guard, and they could get through the day. Uh, and, the, and also the ones who got to it also had a big goal. He talked about what kept him going was his hope. Now, this was an interesting one because he had the hope he'd meet his wife again. He wanted to live to meet his wife again. Uh, now, he never met his wife again, but that hope, and in fact, she was dead at the time he was hoping it. Uh, uh, but that kept him going. So that's a whole interesting... Creative hope you can. Motivates. You can indeed. Even if, even if she's not... Anything that motivates you to do this. Yeah. 
Yeah, and humans do that. Humans, that's what we create stories of uh, uh, that are motivated that have no provability, do you know what I mean, as such, uh, in the spiritual realm, if you like. Uh, and I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in spirituality and hope uh, uh, as, as a system as this way. So, um, but he's a lot of interesting to say. So, so I'll just put a couple of these things on, and then we'll get back into a discussion. Uh, but um, the first thing is accept the reality in front of you. So that's what I'm trying to propose today, is, is not, not fool yourself about how where we are. Uh, create meaningful goals in those circumstances about what you want to do. Uh, focus on the good things, the opportunities in the current situation. Adopt that courage and determine never give up. Uh, focusing on adapting, learning to change, building your relevant skills in this t t time. Not thinking about what skills are useful, what skills, not, not what skills will be useful for me now or in this current world. What skills are, what do I need to know for the future for these things that are coming? That's, they're very good questions uh, uh, about what will be needed in society. Like will, will, um, like will society, for example, need quantity surveying in the future? Or accountancy? Or Dermot Bannon? On, on room to improve, uh, or whatever. So uh, it's worth um, reflecting about what's needed. He can go with the dash, can't he? <laughs> <laughs> of course he can. I've, I don't run out of hope. Uh, sorry, Dermot. Uh, uh, I know. He, I know he's a. He's a. What's it called? A national treasure, is he? Uh, uh, not in my house, anyway. Uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, and then the important thing of uh, looking after yourself and exercise. Uh, one thing I've learned is even though I'm worried about all this and I used to uh, be up at night for nights on end worrying and uh, I'm now better grip on my mental health and my focus on, on this. So I, I work hard in these areas. I know what I'm trying to do, but I don't think about it all the time. I live a, a good life. I enjoy the life I have. I focus on... Uh, uh, and, and one of the gifts of this awareness I wanted to mention to you is it makes life very valuable and very precious. Uh, when you realize the difficult circumstances and all the things we have here and we enjoy, you can really appreciate them more. Uh, sometimes when I, um, if you out and you get, you know, like a, uh, I remember you, you, get, maybe you get a glass of water and there's a, somebody's put a lime in it. Do you, do you want a little piece of lime? That's maybe come from, you know, uh, South America or something. That, and I think, you could think, oh, that's terrible that this consumer world's brought this lime. We should, we should have something local like a, like a, you know, a blackberry or a what's a, what's a, a turnip. <laughs> Go, ah, now. So you, you're, you're going into the real misery, aren't you? The turnip. There, there, there are blackberries in Ireland and red currants and apples. I like the turnip, though, idea. Rhubarb as well. Uh, but... Instead of, but you could, you could get into a rage about that, or you could think, I'm going to enjoy this lime, this precious thing that's been given to me in this moment, that I'm lucky to have that experience. So, so you don't have to be a killer. You can enjoy what you have, uh, which, had, which has been given to you at great cost to the natural environment. Uh, 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 but you, you, you don't have to be a killjoy. I don't go into any of those. Things. You live your life the best you can, in that, and you can savor things and precious things in, in that way. So um, let's um, just bring a couple of things on then. Uh, obviously, there's family and community in the levels that, that in, in family community is about reaching out and connecting to others, creating shared visions, share resources, learning to share is very important, building sustainable community systems, uh, that you're all in there. Um, uh, and then equally, there's also national and international resilience. Like, I think there is, like, you're getting into a big wider system, but I think there are things to be done nationally that you could influence, like that um, rather than having a goal for growth or more international companies in Ireland or, you know, inward investment, all these old system things, could we try to help people think about energy independence or food security or the protection of nature in Ireland? These are, these are really make a difference if they, if they work on these things now. Do you, do you know what I mean? That, uh, 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 um, uh, do we, we, that potentially could be influence the national agenda to those things. Um, and then global internationally, there's obviously lots of challenges. Glo uh, in COP meetings, uh, you could, uh, our COP out meetings, as I like to call them, <laughs> our COP on meetings. <laughs> it's very replete. It's, 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 it's actually in the name, the jokes. So, uh, but, but, but still, at least, there's, at least they're happening. At least there's some conversation uh, uh, happening in that. Uh, uh, so let's, um, uh, let's do another little breakout, I think, because just as a time, just have a little think about resilience yourselves in your group. Go back to your group. You can reorganize re things in your table. Maybe 
just change the little bit of dynamics so you're talking to a couple of different people uh, that might just turn a different way and but it's still be in twos or threes have a little chat about resilience how person resilient are you how can you build your resilience and so forth yeah so do a little bit of moving a bit of moving a bit of discussion another few minutes So we're going to bring you back there. So uh, uh, just be interested to get a, uh, a couple of comments, just a little uh, feedback. Uh, if anyone would like to, uh, just about what you've been discussed or something to say, maybe from the, the left hand corner over there in that area. Um, yeah, perfect. So take this lady first, yeah. Yes. And maybe we could just read a book or a poem yes. or enlarge something new. So it doesn't have to be out there, you know, being very, very active because you might not have the spare capacity yeah. to do that. Exactly. Because that will help nurture your resilience if you, if you yeah. do something really tiny, even like. It makes a huge, I absolutely read a book or to take an interest or make a call or join, come to a meeting or join a, join a group. Yeah. 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 Sorry, what's the point? Slow down. Walk slower. Walk slower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That can help. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right because uh, one, of the, one of the things that happens in a cry is people panic uh, and they do things quickly. But in a, in a sort of, uh, sometimes that's useful. Like if there's a fire, it's a good thing to move quickly away from the fire. But in a sort of slow moving, chronic complicated crisis here panic isn't helpful in fact it's sort of so you want to sort of slow down and make good choices and we're going to talk about that in a minute uh, when, uh, in, 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 about how to do that so slow down is a very good thing and focus on what you can do in the little center your locus of control don't if you worry about what what discussions over there you'd be driven mad so focus on the little bit you can do what contribution can i make uh, in this and that's empowering and that makes you feel better and it, and it can make a big difference and uh, there's lots of people who've made just small steps who made enormous difference uh, the, my personal hero is Greta Thunberg um, for loads of reasons because uh, you know she had um, uh, very serious mental health problems she was silent she couldn't talk she wasn't eating uh, um, and because she was worried about the climate crisis as a, as a, and everyone was gaslighting her saying, oh, don't worry about it. Ryan Tubbler is telling her, I think you should just read a book uh, and so forth. So, uh, uh, but then she found her voice by being the leader of the world in a sort of movement of, of a, a very uh, important voice. And that liberated her and many, many other people. So, so, so she, I see her as a hero. So there's a lot of things, and she's that book, it, it, you're, you're, nobody's too small make a difference so so you focus on your locus of control and what you can do that's a wonderful uh, point uh, there uh, Ilana, yeah yeah i think one maybe unintended aspect about today was uh creating intergenerational spaces yeah and i think just not to put you on the spot uh, but, uh just having but you're representing the youth yeah, of the world <laughs> having having conversation with people who uh have many more years ahead of them than some of the rest of us and who are having, who are looking at the problems from a different angle. I think bringing, that's a, a kind of resilience building um, project that I would like to be more involved with is bringing people together who are approaching this reckoning from very different perspectives and people who uh, are, 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 you know, I feel accountable to Aki because, because I am of an older generation and I need to think about what his generation is facing um, that maybe 
it, my fault, our fault. Um, so yeah, I, th I think there's a different level of accountability when there are young people in, in a room. Um, because in a way we have a lot to answer to, a lot to answer for. Um, so yeah, I think I would love to hear for more from the young yeah. people. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's hear some, I'd like to hear from a young person. No pressure. <laughs> It, it, and you know where you can self-identify? because it, it, <laughs> Somebody could think they're young, that's okay. But there's a biological determinant there, definitely. <laughs> so uh, maybe from the table there, what's, what's your thoughts? Who'd like to come in? Are you interested? Yourself? You're... Um, yeah, something that I was thinking about with this yeah. uh, framework here is also your, your, sort of your capacity to move on and to think about other people. Uh -huh. Yeah. And it sort of shows how the two are intertwined because if you're someone, if you're an individual and you can't put food on the table yeah. or you can't feed your children, mm. how can you expect that person to care about the environment? Right. Once yeah. you start caring about their community and national. And I think that's something that's it's something that's been interwoven very well all day. Yes. Yeah. It needs to be an all time conversation yeah. to be important to social justice. Absolutely. hundred percent. Because like, it's a very unjust model that we're living in. Uh, and we want to care for each other. So that builds capacity and resilience, isn't it? Uh, in, 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 uh, so I, th I think that's a great, great point. Um, uh, can I follow on from what Adam yes, said there? Please. Like, like indigenous peoples yeah. that farm the land, and mm -hmm. they are invested in the land, the families survive yeah. because of their traditions yes. grow, mm -hmm. culture develops. And so that's something that, you know, I know it's in the global south, especially um, that we hear, you know, um, projects that try to, try to learn things that are going to be forgotten because they've never been written down yeah. or never been captured before. Yeah. Um, and so I think that we can learn from we can. that. And, that, and that, that's a brilliant point. Uh, because the, econ the extractive economic model is only one model, and there is plenty of indigenous models that, uh, that uh, generations of people who lived for a long, without any damage to the environment, or very minimal damage. Uh, so, so yeah, absolutely, so that, there's a lot to learn from those generations. And I find the great, when, when I, as I say, I was in, uh, I, 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 in Leitrim, I have a small little agroforestry farm there, and the people I know most are from the old farmers. To, who, who did it? You, they, they, they did all this themselves. They didn't have the other. Uh, and there's uh, one particular farmer who, who sort of takes me under his wing, who's in his uh, 80s, and he, he knows all this stuff uh, for the, how to do stuff that, that, that young people really don't know what he knows these days. You know, so that's a really helpful. They connection. were growing organic without realizing they were it was organic. organic yeah. They were collecting seaweed that's and correct. drying it yeah. out and that's putting it on the said. land yeah, and yeah. doing the nourishing yeah. soil and, and yeah. you know, all that um, yeah. without. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I provide him entertaining stories that he can tell all his friends in the pub. Yeah. Uh, but the, <laughs> that's the, that's the, that's the trade-off. He comes and teaches me things uh, and so forth. Yeah. So we're going to move on to, um, we have to move on just to, to, we're going to do an interview. Isn't that right, Pat? Uh, uh, just a chat, okay? Just with time. So, sorry, I'm sorry for all the other, uh, uh, and we're going to take it, uh, then we're going to fin uh, finish with maybe a couple more things. So Pat, you want to do that? We've got te 10 minutes now. Around that. Okay. Just I want to make it. Um, Anne outside wants you to. Um, Sorry, Anne, Anne just asked me if, if anyone is taking photographs during the event, could they please forward to Anne? at info at greenfoundationireland.ie, and we'll put them on the website. This event is free, but we do have a donation box at the registration desk. If you want to donate, please do so. So I'm just gonna start with, with John on a few quick questions. I'm an environmental communication expert, if you can yeah. call me that. My area of interest is in the media, and storytelling, and the power of storytelling in communicating the climate crisis. So we do a lot of psychology, but mainly from how psychology is represented in film and in media generally, and how it sort of communicates issues. So I just want to just, just tease out with John a few things, mainly focusing on the psychology, because we can all talk about politics and the who, who does what and whatever, but 
Psychology is the key thing, I think, John, that mm -hmm. sort of I want to just... So you talk a good bit about courage. So I'd like to hear a bit more about how you think courage could be used psychologically to help drive this agenda to make us more engaged with the environmental agenda. Well, well uh, courage is one of these um, long-standing human virtues, uh, you mm. know, like, uh, that is cross-cultural. Uh, I used to do a, a talk on sort of uh, what virtues or, or, or character strengths really make a difference to a person's well-being. And one I used to talk uh, that's not well known in, in the modern is, is courage. Uh, but, but if you look at ancient traditions, cultivating courage was a really important thing that you wanted your children to have. So, so courage is, every, is everything to, to get people that uh, this is tough, but we can get through together. You can have courage. You have to sort of activate it. It's a, it's a virtue mm. that's activated by heart, and it's activated by hardship. It's not activated by comfort. So that's why um, we don't have it as much in the Western world, because oh, everything's about comfort. But say the Ukrainians are courageous when they're fighting uh, for, their, uh, for their country. Yeah, uh, the, uh, so, so that activate when you talk to the, the people there, how are they coping, why are they, you know, that they will engage in those, because they believe in something that they have to fight for. So I think courage can be activated. So. And from your research, is there anything particularly Irish about activating courage that's not more universal, or are you talking in universal terms? I mean, just... I'm, I'm talking more universal. I don't, that would be a really mm. interesting thing to explore, Pat, about mm. Irish stories of courage and how they mm. could be... Because I know you're, you're interested in storytelling. Yeah. You probably know more is about the Irish tradition of courage mm. and storytelling. Mm. Maybe there's some ancient myths that that could help us in this, uh, in this regard of activating courage and so forth, yeah. Yeah, I, I would argue that the power of media can be very effective in giving us ideas and empowering us to give mm. us a sense of being courageous in these dire situations that we're facing in the future, as, as John is sort of alluding to, that you know, things are gonna get much worse. So linked to that would be resilience and, and where you think the psychology of resilience could be effective in trying to cope with this. I mean, we, we've had a few chats on it, but is there any, any particular psychological aspects of resilience that pushes your boat that you feel can work from an environmental perspective? Um, you know, well, well, the, the things I, I list that are very important is, is helping people sort of focus on what they can do themselves, mm. like the small steps and building their capacity, mm. um, building you know, and, and taking steps in that direction. They're all build resilience. A lot of it's an attitude. It resilience is like an attitude to your circumstances that you, mm. uh, rather than thinking, oh, this is terrible, what's happened to me? You think, well, you know, I'm going to live, I'm going to be strong, I'm going to do my best, I'm going to care for you. Commit to a set of values and virtues. Mm. So, I, so I think it's a, it's a complicated thing, you know, to, 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 to build, but, but equally a very human response to these circumstances. Being a bit controversial, I really like the last person talk about where they were talking about people need to put food on the table and whatever. Yeah. There's a big tension that environmentalists are all nice middle class people mm. who want to protect the environment because they have the luxury of protecting the environment. So where do you think psychologically we can grow that to involve more different ethnic groups, different race, class, gender, and all the sort of the other aspects of human nature that could help drive an environmental agenda that needs to be political. Yeah. So your, your question is how to include a broad yeah, base of people. how to include a broad base rather than seeing psychology as just atomized into individuals. Uh, well, well I, th I think what we're trying to do here is bring people together and listen uh, and, and address, uh, identify very strongly with social justice is very important. That actually, uh, that what, what we're trying to do is share the, res uh, the resources that, that, uh, that are out there rather than them being just uh, located in a very narrow few or an elite. So I think, I think identifying very much as a, so as a social justice movement is very powerful and that, that's something that uh, the environment should be an ally to. So, uh, so that, I think that would be the, the very important part of it. So like, it, 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 as you say, things are, things are in a very chaotic uh, uh, potential. So it's about like how can we bond together, you know, in this in these in these difficult circumstances. How can we bond together, mm. build cohesion, personally, but with your family and with your community and all people in your community. You know, how can we? Mm. Let, we're in this together. Let's get that in. We're in this together uh, metaphor and let's work together and see people have having different skills, uh, different things to contribute. Yeah, so so we're working together is the key part. Working together is the key, key attribute I would think on that is altruism, of having that sense of 
seeing the connection that not just being selfish, the ego, the selfish sort of thing. So can psychological theories help drive that? Uh, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if it's altruism as such. It's more like, uh, it, it's, it's like desperation. <laughs> if, you're, if your neighbor has two loaves and you've none, uh, you want to bond with him to get a loaf, but you might offer something else as a, as a, as a skill in return. You can create a community. So it's, it's more in self-interest human communities working as well, as much okay. as, as an altruistic. Altruism is an important part of human, because people have to care. Like, because one of the things I didn't put up there is that actually, what can we do? Constructive action. Uh, taking steps to care for, for the casualties of all this and, uh, and the people who are marginalized in this and the people who are less well off, that's something you, you, you can do is make a difference, yeah. You talked a good bit about eco-anxiety and the mm. fear and, and in environmental communication, we're always worried that people degenerate then into being fearful and then won't be active. So how to make people more active. So how do you, do you think the psychologically, psychological messaging needs to be different for different audiences? Uh, well, no, I think anxiety is a big motive and fear is a big motive for people to act. Yeah. So, so, uh, like, so you do need to worry people a bit with the facts. <laughs> yeah, they, but, but often they worry about the wrong things. Like, you know, uh, are they, are they, tar they pick simple targets. Like you get mass movements against refugees as if they've caused all the problems do, do, because they're manipulating. You know, but that's driven from people being fearful. Yeah. Uh, but if you've got people fearful about, uh, about climate breakdown and biodiversity collapse, uh, then they might act correctly around that. So it's about what they're fearful about, as opposed to fear can be a motivating factor, uh, yeah. but it's just how you process it. You alluded to earlier, and we were talking about the notion of why in the COVID times, we accepted a new narrative. We sort of yeah. became more frugal in our consumption, in our engagement with nature. Why can we not re-engender that? Or is the war narrative the only thing that motivates us? Uh, so, in psychological terms, is there any triggers that you think well, well, I, are important? Uh, well, that's a very good because, like, I think I think the war narrative is what motivates often what motivates yeah. uh, people. Do you remember um, in FASTA we were very interested in that? Uh, at the, uh, you know, the way in Ireland they called the World War II, you know, the new the the emergency, yeah. uh, and there was this huge uh, cooperation that everybody grew food. Uh, all the parks were so uh, my local park St. Dan's was with in, put in potatoes uh, and, and, and so forth and they, people reduced all their fossil because you know, there, there was no uh, oil coming into the country as such you know and uh, uh, they did have to burn a lot of peat but anyway there we go but, uh, but there was this sort of big resilience created in a very oh. difficult and, and yeah. everyone agreed to reduce consumption um, uh, and that's sort of what's needed really oh. But they had a clear enemy and a clear problem that yeah. was communicated to them. Uh, it's a bit so. So in um, when we had a conference there in Fast, uh, you know, ten years, we called the new emergency, trying to uh, alarm in a constructive way about uh, what was going uh, going on. But uh, but of course, uh, people haven't you know that hasn't sunk in fully yet. But it will soon. Do you know, we think there, there will be this but sort of chaotic events, uh, and people will be. Um, will be disoriented and lost. And, and you need thought leaders, like yeah. people to guide people in that sense. That's not, because you'll get then the fascists and people trying to make simple uh, enemies and scapegoats for, for these problems, as opposed to actually, this is a, you know, the, these are the, the malady is our extractive mo model and we need to create better systems and so forth. You need better guides on that, so. Yeah, as you alluded to, and very rightly, yeah. that the climate crisis is a wicked problem. Yeah. And, you know, it needs complex solutions. And some would argue that the climate crisis, we're the problem. So that's why it's not been, yeah. it's not been sort of, is there any psychological that we haven't talked about that you think could trigger that transformational change? You mentioned uh, spiritualism, and I, yeah. I would be a, a strong, admirer of the need for some form of yeah. new form of green spiritualism. Yeah, do, yeah. do you see any other ways of yeah. connecting with, to try and mobilize public opinion in a more proactive way? Yeah, no, I think, I think they're all, like, I, I, I don't, um, in a way, I don't have all those answers. Do you no one so, has. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 but actually, I know somebody, uh, you do, Phil, don't you? Phil, Phil will answer them. Uh, uh, okay, we but, have. But I, I think they're collective. For a fee, I think they're collective questions uh, about. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking, I don't know. I'm like, 
I, I'm more interested in what people think of those questions rather than me. <laughs> Do you know about the questions you're asking? So I'd be interested to know what everyone in the t thinks, because we all need to mobilise and act in those questions. Mm. Um, so maybe, maybe, maybe at that point, because yeah. uh, uh, we need to move on to our last yeah. bit. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Pat, yeah, no for the, okay. those questions, because we're moving on to a, a spiritual perspective. So I just want to close by looking at a, a couple of last things on this, because, uh, and then and Awana is going to uh, um, take us yeah. on something. But uh, I think um, uh, taking a pause is what I wanted to say, because uh, I want to pick up at the point, slow down. The, 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 the lady at the back there. A reflection, yeah. Because as I said, when in an emergency, you can uh, panic. Um, uh, so when, when mm -hmm. think of all the problems that are happening now in the future, you can mm -hmm. easily panic and be overwhelmed. But maybe we need, just need to pause and take a moment um, and so we can consciously choose our next response. Uh, and, and I think you need to cultivate, uh, to pick up on Pat's point, you need to cultivate... Uh, a very important part is cultivating some sort of spiritual practice. I, that's been very helpful to me uh, in these difficult, in the middle of the night when I'm awake <laughs> at four in the morning worrying about this. Uh, don't read The Guardian again. I'm thinking of myself. Uh, 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 or the science journals. Uh, and so, uh, and I, but I'm trying to learn a spiritual practice where I try to pause and think what's the best I can do in this, in this moment or what contribution can I make? So uh, cultivating a, a spiritual practice, whatever that means to you, uh, even you can, you can call it a psychological practice of mindfulness, uh, uh, whichever fits in your paradigm. Um, so as a way of just pausing to finish, uh, uh, Awan is going to lead us in, a, in such an exercise. Because um, uh, Awan is a, a theologian. She didn't... Uh, it's, it's, uh, and, and just uh, she, And she just got her <coughs> doctorate in theology. So give her a round of applause. One thing I've noticed, uh, so I sound like this because I grew up in the U.S., but I'm originally from uh, Romania. And when I first started getting involved with activism in Ireland, I made the mistake of mentioning that I was interested in spirituality <laughs> and just kind of heard crickets in the room. And then uh, quickly found out that I needed to find a different way to talk about what I want to talk about, which is that this, this dimension uh, is a human dimension. It's not the state doesn't own spirituality. So the construction of the Irish identity as you know the Celtic uh, uh, revival that the state doesn't own whatever your spirituality is. The church doesn't own your spirituality. Spirituality is a human dimension. It's the need to contend with existential questions, with pain, with suffering, with injustice, with why uh, you know everything from why bad things happen why to good people and those kinds of questions. So it belongs to you. That, that dimension belongs to you. Um, and just to speak from my, uh, my sort of spiritual background, I actually met, uh, John, maybe I'm betraying you, but we met at a Quaker meeting. So I, for me, my practice of sitting in silence with other people, which is essentially what what being uh, in a Quaker meeting is about. That's as close as I get to being spiritual with other people. And what that trained me to do is to know how it feels in my body when I need to speak. And so in that space with other people, you know, it's, it's awkward to speak in front of other people, to break silence. And that became a kind of metaphor for how I felt in social situations when there's a need to speak. I know now, because of that experience, it trained me to know what it feels like in my body when I need to speak up about something. Um, so I would say if we can think of spirituality in this context, not as something about transcendence, but actually something that puts us in contact with our body, with our experience, the experience that we're having. So one of the things that probably none of us were thinking about while we've been sitting here, is that we're sitting here in our bodies that <laughs> carry us around, and that when we hear things that are um, fearful, or when we're excited about possibly new possibilities, there are millions of reactions happening inside of us. And we don't have any trouble accepting that if we get <coughs> bad news, sometimes people faint if they get bad news. That's a connection between emotion and, and what's happening physically inside of us. 
So that connection is always there. So what I wanted to leave you with is, in a sense, a moment to just for us to acknowledge that we're in this space together and that something happened here today that could only happen with the people that are in this room right now, the conversation that could only happen with who is here. And to leave you with the idea that this comes from a, a, a African-American theologian that I have studied, Howard Thurman, who says, don't ask yourself just what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive. And go do that, because what the world needs is people who have come alive. And so that may seem a little contradictory. We've just been talking about all the problems that are needed. But ask yourself first, what makes you come alive? Is it a sea swim? Is it spending time with your pet? Is it spending time with your family? What is it that makes you come alive? That, doing that is a form of spirituality. Doing that, making yourself, bringing the best of yourself to the challenges that we face is a form of spirituality. Um, and then one other uh, quote that I'll leave you with is uh, from Joanna Macy, who is the person who um, created the, the language around active hope. And if you're interested in, in that idea of active hope, of hope in action, I would very much recommend looking at Joanna Macy. Um, and she has said, nothing that ever happens to me, though really nothing, including what happens during life or in death, can ever separate me from the body of the earth. And so the body of the earth is this great resource that we have. And it's, we have now all the studies uh, to tell us what intuitively we already knew, which is that if we spend time in a forest, we have studies that show us that it improves the our microbiome, so it improves our gut health, which improves the quality of the kinds of thoughts and emotions we have. So we didn't need to know that. We knew that if we go for a walk somewhere nice, somewhere that, that we enjoy, that we feel better. But now we even have the proof. And so if we think about this, that nothing, nothing, except I guess if anybody here is planning to go to Mars, but nothing that can ever happen to us can separate us from the body of the earth. And that is, that is a tremendous resource. And so if that's something that helps you come alive, then access it as often as you can and see that as part of your activism. See that as part of your way of being uh, active in addressing the challenges that we're facing. So I, I think I'll leave you with that. Long okay. Enough. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I think we've just, uh, we've just uh, finished there. It's just five o'clock. Uh, Please fill in the feedback forms. There's a few in the centre of the table. Uh, I'm very interested to know what you think uh, about uh, this experience and uh, what else you want or need. Uh, I, I, I feel a commitment to try to support people in this area who are activists, who are environmentalists, uh, psychologically and philosophically. And so uh, feel free to put down what you want. And I'm trying to learn how to help people more and better in that area. So feel free to put down whatever you what feedback you want to give, and uh, we'll see what else we, we, we can provide. And if you leave your email, I, I can keep in touch with you. I'll, I'll send you some uh, stuff and things uh, uh, if you want to do that. Okay? So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.